with uh, Nagatula and Nemanyama at the time. And then it's the, tor the torch has been passed through several people. And I'm just so grateful that Daria is keeping it going. And I guess Katie is as well. So here's to Daria, who's not feeling all that well today. So, and then Heimberg. What's that? Tom Heimberg. And then Sorry. Ethan. And then Ethan. Ethan Hawk, oops. <laughs> Ethan. <laughs> and the wishes. And uh, then, I don't know, Daria, who is next? Uh, you're still muted. Who's muted? Um, Daria. I, um, yeah, let's not talk about that. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, I think um, Katie and Daria, would you like to say anything before we commence here? We, well, we, we want to wholeheartedly welcome Eleanor Angel, who has this amazing history with this organization, and we have to thank for mm. Northern California Viola Society, and, mm. um, and also um, her really fascinating background and influences are, um, I think, going to be wonderful for, for everyone to hear about. And I don't want to take up any more of the time. So <laughs> okay. I'm going to pass it over to you. Now, Eleanor, for now, should we all remain muted? Um, and... Let's, yes, I guess let's do that. But I'd like to do, um, you know, time will fly by fast. And I'd like to try and be as organized as possible. And just simply to introduce, um, uh, I would like, to, I'd be honored to um, share with you, I'm writing a book that I'm calling Walk on the Primrose Path, <clears throat> Lessons from the Essence of a Genius. And I wanted to say, I guess go ahead and mute, but anytime that you really would like to ask a question, maybe just raise your hand or wiggle your bow, but if, I'll try to be concise and then leave enough time so we can have questions and discussion at the end. How about that? Yeah? So I wanted to say that, oh, David, Oh, we are we I guess I'll mute unless you can unmute yourselves you all know how to if yeah anyway so I'd like to share that um, along with writing this book I, I feel that there's they say that luck is when preparation meets with opportunity and I think that carries into whatever field it is that we choose to endeavor and I was the lucky person who ended up getting to live at William Primrose's house from September until May when he died um, in 1981. Um, there were a couple of amazing students waiting nearby and I was fortunate because Hiroko Primrose, William's wife, was um, from Japan and they had met in Indiana University, which was a graduate student and I had the good fortune of studying teaching methods with her as well living at their house, cooking meals, driving him places, typing Mr. Primrose's letters, and then having lessons when he felt well enough on certain days. So it was really luck, absolutely. But I feel that he, in the tradition of his teacher, Eugene Izai, had summed me up completely already when I played for him at the audition. And so the first lesson, if, you're all willing. I would like to share with you how I've written the first lesson and, and I'd be grateful at the end if you think anything doesn't make sense as we're going along. But I'd like to read to you what I've written about the first lesson and then um, I will grab my viola and interrupt and want you to grab your violas and do the same thing, pretending it's your lesson. So here we go. It was finally the day Hiroko came to say, William is feeling well enough for a viola lesson and he'll meet you in the living room. I went downstairs, collected my viola, my music and myself. And I do have a photograph of, that I took from my little camera <laughs> in the living room, which I'd like to include. But as I entered the living room, Mr. Primrose sat in a large linen chair with his viola case opened on the ottoman next to him. I placed my music and my pencil on the music stand and stood ready for my first lesson. Stop that, he said. 
stop what? I hadn't been doing anything. So now I'd like you all to just get your bows, okay? So while I was standing there ready and attentive for my lesson, I was holding my bow in what I thought was the ideal bow hold, we all say. And he went on to say, if you hold your fingers perched and ready on the bow, they will be rigid. Instead, hold the bow like a club or a tennis racket. He reached for his viola, his bow and his viola. I forgot, get your violas. <laughs> Oops. When you are in a physically, uh, oh, so, yeah, his viola. When you, when you are in a physically natural position, you will be able and ready to play instantly. Imagine, he continued, a rope is tied with a knot above your wrist on the right-hand side of your arm, and there's a knot below your wrist. The rope is being pushed and pulled across the strings as if the rope were in a tug of war game. One should think push bow in France, he said, they say poussier or push instead of down bow and tirez or pull instead of up bow. One should think push bow and pull bow rather than down bow and up bow. Mr. Primrose proceeded to demonstrate by pulling his bow across all four strings from the lowest to the highest, and then pushing them back from the highest to the lowest string. Um, first, I forgot I'm gonna add, he did put his wrist right up on the bridge. Try doing that. Just the, like your hand is like a tennis racket or a club, comfortable, ready to go. And you just place your wrist right on the bridge. So you can feel the weight of your arm comfortably, naturally falling, right? Then, so then in the tradition of, instead of being perched, ready. So you would go from this position right instantly into and stay on the A string. Just feel the weight of your arm the same way it felt on the bridge and we'll pull. Stay at the tip when you get there. Try again. And then we'll push back or pull. You can feel as if you're following through as well. So push and pull or... Whoops, I should face this way. Okay, so that's the essence of using natural weight to pull. By using the natural weight of his arm and following the subtle arc of the bridge out toward a deep and luscious sound. He continued while playing just one sustained note and I'll do it above the string because I wanna talk. Look, he said, I can play without my pointer finger. Can you see? So he, Go ahead and try that if you want, on because I can't hear you guys. I can play without my pointer finger. And he, sorry, I'll read. And he lifted it up and placed it back down on the bow. I can play without my middle finger, same thing, or my ring finger, or my pinky finger, as he lifted each finger up and down, off and back onto the stick. <laughs> Resonating vibrations continued to pour out of his instrument. So he's going up and down on each one. Let's see if I can show, but try. You can try one finger at a time, seeing if you can still have that push pull without needing to use each finger. Look, he said with a childlike twinkle in his eyes, I can even play without using my thumb. And he did, so I don't know if you can see that. You can try doing that so it's still feeling the natural weight of the arm. 
He proudly released his thumb out from under the frog and replaced it back with ease. All the while, a rich and sonorous golden tone continued to pour out of his viola. Now, he said, take off that shoulder rest. And that's a whole nother topic we really won't need to get into today because I think it's people's personal choice. But I, at the time, had a very high resonance shoulder rest and I had to cold turkey just take that off. And I, I now use a sponge and I think people have their own opinion about that. Another day we can talk about it, but I'll tell you why. He said, now he said, I, I'm not sure if he recognized the shock on my face. How could I play without my shoulder rest? But Mr. Primrose went on to say, you'll have much more freedom and flexibility without the shoulder rest. Without it, you will be able to rotate your viola towards or away from the strings, the bow, as you're bowing, right? And so if, if, it's, if it's rigid on a shoulder rest, then there's less flexibility to be doing that. And, <laughs> I, I have a picture here, but it's so tiny. I don't know if I can share in the book. I'll have a huge one, but it shows him. Uh, it's a beautiful picture. I have permission from Brigham Young University to publish those, and it shows him um, from behind, and you can see this rotation and freedom. So now, um, in order to maintain a stable instrument, he said, when I shift up into the higher positions, I push the viola in towards my neck. When I shift downwards, I give a quick squeeze on the chin rest. So you can imagine you're about to go down and you just give a little squeeze to make sure it's holding on. I'm not saying that we should do that, but I'm telling you what he told me. <laughs> Mr. Primrose continued to demonstrate the push-pull with a deep fluid sound. Suddenly, still playing, he lifted his viola and placed it right on top of his head. And then he played on his side and said, I can even play on my back. His body stayed relaxed and his sound was still glorious. I wrote, I was amazed because when I'd seen him on film, you know, he always seems to look so still and yet, you know, so do ride, riders when they're riding dressage on a horse. You know, I've come to learn that, but it's a, an internal thing and a flexing that we're feeling. So um, I am going to shift over into giving you this great exercise for practicing, but first maybe we could take like up until, I don't, let's 10 minutes to see if anybody has any questions or feedback about um, what I've talked about so far. I'm all yours. <laughs> Otherwise, I might um, volunteer like David Bowes because he does do Feldenkrais and see if you have any opinions about the natural body position and weight and playing. Could you demonstrate the thumb, thumbless position? Okay. I, I yeah, I find, it. I mean, some people can't do it, but I kind of, uh, I remember this wonderful cello teacher, Margaret Rowell, who is from the Bay Area, that spoke about baby grip. You know, people hold hands like this, but a baby kind of clings on with just the finger fingerprint grips, you know, and it's clinging on. And so I think that when you do that, you're able to still ride along the string and release your thumb. So I'll try doing it so that the camera will show somehow. So it's in. I have to kind of hook it a little bit too, maybe. You can still feel. Does that answer it a little bit enough? <laughs> Who was that, Ted? I, I can play with it. You can play with it, okay. You asked me to comment. I was just gonna say that it just seems like he offered you a lot of options and mm -hmm. a lot of things that really departed from what was considered the norm at, you know, what, what people knew how to do. And yeah. options are always a good thing. In Feldenkrais, when I teach, I always say, 
you know, you have an option of doing this, you have an option of doing that, so. Oh, that's good, that's interesting. <clears throat> I did hear that um, Lillian Fuchs, who had studied with him, insisted all the female would wear dresses that they could pull so it was just a viola directly on your skin. But I think that was Karen Tuttle. I mean, Karen Tuttle, I, yes, thank you for the correction, but I do think that's Lillian, really- Lillian always wore a Chanel suit with a blouse <laughs> underneath. Oh, that's, that's nice. Anything uh, to add, Tom Tatton? No. <laughs> no, okay. I'm just enjoying. Okay, well, um, I'll just continue on then. Um, uh, something that I think I just, I, I think- I just, I wanted to add that the only, the only thing with having in the viola on your skin is that it, it like- Oh, right. Varnish off. And some, t and I find the reason I just use this little spongy thing is that depending on what clothing you're wearing, it's, it just helps it from not sliding down, you know? So, David? Just one really quick thing. I think for me, the discovery from being a kid to an adult was more about what, what is comfortable as a chin rest. And Linda uh -huh. Gassi DeLuca, who was my stand partner in New York City, and was in the Bay Area for many years, has this thing called an elephant ear. And it is so comfortable, you can rotate your head this way, you can Oh, nice. Way. It almost doesn't matter what's underneath. Yeah, oh, that sounds terrific. She's great. Like custom, custom made. Okay, I'm gonna continue on just so we can cover more um, and read a little bit more here because we did this, oh, oh, actually, what I'd like to add, I skipped a page, is from the push-pull, and we can all do this together. Anyone who has your viola and bow, have that ready. That would be great. So um, I'm not going to read out, out of the book how I explained it. I'll just show you. After playing open every string and staying held on the A, and then you use your arm weight to go back. And this originates all the way back from Primrose having studied with Eugene Izai, who was an incredible violinist and teacher. So what he says, first of all, slowly, you're going to play open one, open one, open one, open one on all the fingers. So you do. And stay on the B at the top. And then on the way down, you'll be playing one open, one open, one open. So. So let's try it slowly together. Open one all the way up. I'll just say it. it might be slow, ready, C, D. Open. All right, and we hold and then push back. I'm doing it fast in a nutshell, but the next thing you would do is now that you've taught that fingering to yourself, you do the same, this push-pull motion again. But I'm gonna add the fingering we did, so we go fast. And then lift up. A little tricky to talk and play at the same time. You can do it a couple times. And then lift up. And you want to concentrate the finger on lifting. And he said, or I remember the idea, you want to think I'm as if you touched a hot flame. It's about lifting your fingers up, not pushing them down. But feeling that weight of your bow arm as a separate thing that's just pushing and pulling with the weight of your body. So we're going to do the next step would be 012, 012, same thing on each string going up. And on the way down, we lift them 210. So I'll show it once. And let's just play a high second finger. It'll be a strange scale. And then we lift them up on the way back. Make sense? Let's try that. 012. Sound. All right. 
Wait. I don't know how it sounds on Zoom. <laughs> and then same process, oh, one, two, three. And we'll just have high second fingers. I'm gonna do slow and then fast at your own pace. Or you can start with the opens again to get the feeling. And push. And of course, you could continue that three octaves if you wanted to. So, right. And that feeling of push and pull is continuing. And it's really nice because it's a se it's separating the, we have by polar by, by our, both of our sides want to do the same thing. So it gives us an opportunity to be having this push pull no matter what. And then we can decide whether it's a light or heavy weight in our bow for the dynamics. But then the fingers feel light and rapid as they're going up. So I have to confess, I, I definitely could do it more. I have not really been practicing much during this lovely COVID time. So I went from not warmed up to that. And I found doing that simple what is it, five minutes goes from zero to warmed up really fast because it just reminds the body to have the weight in the arm and the light left hand. And Can I ask a basic question? Uh-huh, is that Harry? I, I missed, so the, the push, oh, push yeah. is the down bow or the up bow? You know, uh, my friend Carol's here who speaks some French and I think I get confused, but the idea, you know, it's funny because we do say up bow and it makes sense on the A string but when we're on the C string, it almost feels like down. So if somebody knows French better than I do, it's pushing and pulling the string rather than thinking down and up bow, you're using the weight of your arm, pushing back and forth to the string. I, I think it's um, that it's, it's pull and then push. Pulling down and yeah. pushing up. I think, I think that's right, Darius. Tire and pousse. Yeah, okay, so we're pulling Tire. and maybe Harry, I'm not sure if you were here, but he was also explaining that you can use the rotation of your viola a little bit like I'm exaggerating a lot right now. But as you so it's pushing this way and then pulling back down this way. Right. Yeah. So um, I would like to then, it, you know, I'll just go, maybe it was a different lesson, I'm not sure, but I'll show you and I don't know, we're gonna video this. I didn't do the technology, but Primrose leaned down and he always used a red pencil. That's one thing he really taught me. It's what we see visually best and it was all over his concertos and his pieces. So that red pencil really pops. I have this photocopy back from 1981. <laughs> He jogged this, jotted it down. Can you see? Kind of? Yes, no, somebody? Yes. Anyway, it looks, it looks a bit uh, like hieroglyphics. Um, but he went on to explain, and I've written out um, in the book too, but I used a sample of the Telemann Concerto. He, he, he was explaining that this is how to practice something in 16th notes or triplets, two different patterns, um, so that you will completely nail the passage. Um, and, but before that, while he was doodling down these strange, they were actually slurs and dots. And so I've translated into real notes that um, I'd be happy to take a picture of or send to anyone who's interested. Um, but, he explained that back in the 1950s, when he was doing a recording, he said he would walk into a room and there was one kind of big old box way up in the corner that was the one microphone. And he said that he had to just, he said, I raised my viola up high and <laughs> lifted the elbow, the elbow down low. And he got to have one take and that was it. There were no edits, there were no cuts, that was it. So he said, in order to feel prepared 100%, he prepared 150% so that when you were on the spot, you were still at 100. So this then he gave as this method. So I'm going to show you and I'd love if you guys would like to play along. I don't, 
I guess I'll you stay muted. Um, I, I did use the spot in the Telemann concerto, but I think it'd be easier. Let's just all do C major uh, two octave scale just to get the idea of this. Um, so what in a nutshell it is, is dividing up this, um, we've all kind of done rhythmic practice, I'm sure, but it's dividing up the passage that's um, in 16th notes right now into various different rhythms and playing each one with only one inch of bow, first at the frog and then the middle and then the tip. So let's try C major scale. The first one is just gonna be slur two, separate two, slur two, separate two. And I'll give us a tempo. Maybe we'll be like, just so we get the idea, but it's gonna just be seriously try to play underneath your winding. We're gonna do just an inch. It's really only nothing, like no bow virtually. Okay, so we're gonna, here we go and. I did too much bow and also forgot to say, don't, don't repeat the top notes. Let's do it once more, less bow and almost just be using your fingers, flexible fingers, ready and. Now, same thing, exactly. We're gonna go into the middle of the bow, right in the middle of the bow, and just use one inch, same bowing. I'll just go in. Making it a short excerpt. Okay, same thing at the tip. Very, very tip. Starting down bow, one inch, uh, here we go, and. Good, same, th okay, now we're doing the same rhythm, same thing, but we start up bow at the frog. Up bow, slur, or separate. Up bow, same thing, ready, and. Oops, I used a lot of up. Okay, now, same thing, we're gonna start. Second rhythm is, is one, it's a down, up, down, up, down, up. Down, up, down, up, down, up, right? Starting at the frog down bow, ready, and. Oh, sorry, and. Down bow at the middle, ready, down, up, down, up, down, up. the tip and okay same rhythm starting up bow with the frog one inch ready and oh, sorry and up bow middle ready and Tip, ready, and. Okay, so then third rhythm is separate slur or separate slur. -er. Let's do it. So down, down, up, slur, -er, sep um, so that it'll be down, up, slur, up, down, slur. 
Jingle Bells. <laughs> Starting frog down bow. Sorry, ready and. <laughs> ready and. <laughs> Third time's a charm, I'm sorry. And. Plus one. Start the frog down, up, down, up. One, two, three, plus. Three plus one. Ready, and. Middle, and. And tip. Starting up bow with the frog, uh, up, down, uh, up, down. <laughs> Harder. <laughs> up and up. <laughs> Sorry about my phone. Huh. Turn that off. Um, we're at Three plus one, starting up bow, ready, and. Tip, sorry. So, um, should I torture you through the rest? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight more rhythm. Uh, okay, you guys are still smiling, so we're gonna do one plus three. One plus three at the frog, down, uh, up, down, uh, up, ready, and. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is the six, seven, and eight are separate bows. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. As I don't know if one inch is even doable, but as little as possible at the frog. Five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> Like that. All right, oops, I went twice. And then middle and. And so forth. And I think I'll just sum up because we can save time right now. So the, the, it's, if anyone wants to take a note, the very first one was slur or separate, slur or separate. Then the second one was short, one slur or short, short slur or short, right? Third one was separate slur or separate slur. -er. And I can send this to you. Third one, fourth one, three plus one, down, up, down, up, right? Uh, and <laughs> and the, uh, the next one is one plus three. So down, up, down, up. Next one is five plus three, because it's combinations within eight. One, two, three, four, five separate bow one two three four five separate bow right the next one is three plus five of course right up down up da 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 five right and then we have two plus six six plus two four plus four and then let's skip to the last two which are kind of popular i think is the long short short long so let's just do it at the we're gonna i just call it long short but it's a dotted 16th, a dotted eighth note with 16th twice. And so we're going. C 
see one do it together. Frog, the frog starting down boat. Ready, and. And the middle, same thing. Ready, and. Down. you can see and uh so that's worth doing the opposite so we'll do the same rhythm but starting up bow at the frog up down up down up down ready and up in the middle and uh. And at the tip, and. Good, and then the opposite is the last one. Short, long, da-da, da-da, da-da. Set up, starting at the frog, ready, and. Middle, and. Tip is our last one, and. So um, let's go ahead and unmute because I'd love to have some open discussion because I'm, oh yeah, actually I'll just say in a nutshell for anyone who's paying attention, I, I've also wrote out the other hieroglyphics, which was the triplets. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, no. Yes. I, what I did was, um, <laughs> I, I did actually in the, the Suzuki repertoire, the witches dance, so I'd have a place to do triplets, but I'm not using repertoire today. But in the case of triplets, his his scoops and dots were one, uh, it, it's slur one, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, so forth. The second one was one, two, three, one, two, three. Is that enough bowing? Can you see the bowing? And then it was slurring two. So it's slurring two, you're dividing your three, you're making it six. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? And then uh, four plus two. One, two, three, four. Right? And two plus four, obviously, right? And uh, five plus one and one plus five. And then he did two plus one and one plus two, so it's. So that was a slur or separate slur, or slur or separate slur, or so it kind of overlaps the three, the patterns of the three, but it's still staying within the mathematical groups. And then he did, uh, so. Two plus one, one plus two, oh, and then he did groups of three slurred. And finally, the easiest one at the end. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Twelve rhythms for the sixteenth notes times six, because we're doing it at the frog middle and the tip with both directions of the bow, right? So, and there's one, two, three, four, five. Seven, eight, nine, ten times on the triplets. So we've got a lot of different combinations, and I think that's truly how he was so prepared. And I don't know. Raise your hands if you've ever heard the recording of Solfeggetto he plays. Jill has. I've never listened to it once without having. Oh, Ted's playing it. <laughs> we can play it without sound. <laughs> and I and it's like faster than Flight of the Bumblebee. Right, doesn't sound What's that? Yeah. So, um, 
Oops. You know, I, any passage, I, the one that we're, we're not playing today, but I was in teaching the Talamon Concerto where you have this measure. <laughs> And that's where everyone's out of tune, self included. So going through that one measure and then perhaps doing the measure before it into it is just tremendous. I mean, it's like you just nail that spot. And obviously, I'm just talking to you about it today, but when I've used this in a passage, you know, it can take, if you're doing an actual eight measure phrase or something, it can take a good hour. But once you're done, I mean, if you can play flexibly at the frog, with a beautiful, you know, bow change and everything and coordinated with your finger, fingers, um, or even at the tip when it's awkward, if you can play in any part of the bow and still have your fingers coordinated and doing what they're doing. Um, and the rhythms are great. He said, make sure when you're doing a fast slow of anything, when you're on the slow note, you hold that as long as you want to, to make sure that your fast gesture after it is correct because there's no point in going zipping through it if it's not correcting, you know, like between the tricky places getting, maybe if I'm going out of tune the whole time, then it's just keeping it that way. So that when you're practicing this method, it might take one hour to do it once, but it's, it's there locked in for the rest of your life. And it's totally solid when you're ready to play. Huh. If only I did what I, said but um you know one thing I, I just coming to my mind right now is that living at his house i was given lots of assignments and and things but primrose himself had bone cancer and was diagnosed after a heart attack with not much chance to live and I, my bedroom was down below his in utah and i could hear him practicing every single day two or three hours so you know he didn't have a concert coming up um, so it, he, it wasn't just do as I say, <laughs> he actually did it. So, um, if you guys actually, I but guess. That's a good model for COVID time, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we have just, I'll say this briefly, I guess we have a couple more minutes and then I'd love to have a little discussion. Oh, no wait, We get to go till 15 after. If, if we need to. Yeah. Oh, 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 I see. Okay, well, would you guys like a little more? Jazz, try anything more? Yeah. Can I ask a little bit, a uh, question? Yeah. Um, so when you're doing um, the three different places in the bow, Yeah. are you going for three different qualities of the sound? Are you trying to mimic the same quality of sound in each? Because I, I mean, it's really easy to be very gritty. I think that that's a great question, Daria. And um for another day and another topic was his assignment for me with Kreutzer 13 which you know I don't know if you know it but it's a lot like the first box we you know it's um oh, yeah. he had me play that with my elbow up against a wall and perch my stand and play that entire thing by only just using my fingers no wrist, no nothing. And, and at that point, he said, it's not about tone whatsoever. You might sound like a burping, erupting toad or something. Yeah. Because yeah. it's going to be really gritty. Right. And so, I was noticing as I was playing that it was some crunchy stuff, but that I'm turning too, but it's, it's really about getting, you know, I like to say brain, don't have a BBF disease. Brain first, fingers second, and then the bow. So it's training the bow, the brain, then the fingers, then the bow. It's the coordination in any part of the bow. So if you end up in the wrong part of the bow while you're playing something, it doesn't really matter. I noticed I was speeding up on the where it's comfortable for 16th notes, which reminds me another tip, Primrose tip. I might put a page of just the tips, but when you're playing repeated fast 16th notes, we tend to just do this, but at that point, use your, your finger or thumb to rotate the bow and make sure that 16th notes are flat bow hair. So you're using all of the hairs. And of course, at the right place in the bow, it's really easy to go fast. Right? But if I'm tipped, it, it, the friction of it being sideways and crooked is gonna make it not very good tone and it's gonna not, not um, grip all the string and get yet 
coordinate it. Right? So at that point, you're just using fingers. So obviously, I guess I was speeding up when it was easier, you know, because it's hard to do the up bow ones at the very tip or, you know, whatever, wherever. But um, it also shows you what part of the bow that you do want to play certain passages in, ultimately. Helps yeah. You. And what your tendencies are for sure, because as you, you know, you see, oh, wait, I, th I thought I was at the frog and then you're, I'm out here or something. Oh, that's the majority of us, I think, tend to do that. I mean, I once played a whole master class of Bach <laughs> using an inch at the tip because, you know, get scared or something. But uh, um, one other... I find, I feel that, that he, this, it, I call it, you know, like the tin man who needs oil. Like if we get this lubricant to this beautiful flexible finger bow change with flat hair at the frog you know then then as we're pulling just you know it doesn't have to be a fast passage i'm just gonna pull or push i guess all the way up and allow that movement and then we're pulling down you know and of course at the tip we don't need those fingers but it's still that feeling of the weight of the arm and the contact. Um, and I, I know Primrose didn't say this, I, at George Yonser at Indiana, since we're talking about it, I, I, I loved his analogy. He said it's like a suspension bridge. So you think of the contact point that's on your string and then your shoulder and wherever you are at, you want to balance that out. So if you're up here, you're pressing too hard. If you're down too low, you've lost that sense of the weight. So. I, I like to think of it as from the elbow to the contact point wherever you're playing that you want that to be level. Because here it'll become a pressure and here it's gonna be losing, we lose, then it's just flop, right? So if we're the very frog, we need that flexibility in the fingers, right? Right. And at the middle, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's hard to be on camera, just a, a level square if we were to put a piece of paper on that you know, wouldn't fall off, not this way either, right? right? And at the tip, in order to keep that contact, then it rotates into this um, front of the index finger, right? When we get to the middle, it rotates, and then at the, at the frog, we don't need the first, the pointer finger at all. So unless um, your Yasha Heifetz and you're studying in the Russian style. So this was really discussing Franco-Belgian style, which Shinichi, <laughs> I love David's demonstration. <laughs> and Alan DeBarrett used to say, if Heifetz had a Franco-Belgian bow arm, he wouldn't have had to practice six hours a day. He'd only have to do two. <laughs> so, you know, it's also, again, like the shoulder rest, it's a choice, but I feel if um, you've got the flexibility to, to go with a nice, even weight sound all the way to the frog, I mean, I vote for that. <laughs> right. Would you, would you do this with a metronome? I, yeah, I was just going to mention that. Thank you, Daria. Um, it depends, you know, if it's the Telemann concerto and a kid, maybe I'd do it the whole thing entirely slowly just at the, the capacity that they can actually just do the bowing and coordinate it. But I think if I were like doing Don Juan and prep for an audition or something, absolutely stick on the metronome. It depends on the level of the piece. Um, I found that little kids before a certain age or comprehension have a real difficult time coordinating with the metronome for some reason. Yes, yes. And it's a lot to think about at the same time. Yeah, that's true. Um, there's a question here also from oh, yeah. Chat. oh yeah what were the favorite exercises for sustained bow strokes um primrose's favorite oh okay i could switch to that if you want to he he wrote out something i i find that's excellent for it i call it the um uh, seamless string crossings but it is sustaining the the notes as well and once again i could write it out in paper, but I won't. I'll just show you. He had me play, I'll do it in slow motion what the notes are, starting with open C. And I'm going to exaggerate with really clunky string crossings right now so you can see what the bowing is. But you play in one down bow, C, D, E, I'm sorry, starting on a D. Four, open, four, open, four, 
And he asked me to do it in a way that you could not visually or orally know that there was a string crossing. So what I just did was not correct. So I'm, I'm gonna try to do what would be, it's great for sustaining anyway. Two, three. You can probably see it moving right now. My lesson, he said, you, I saw that. Do it again. So um, you play one, two, three, four, open. I'll, I'll just do it quickly, but. Two, and change strings. And on the way down. Three, two, one, four. Four, open, four, open, four. And the last one, you can just do an octave. But you want it to be that when you're doing this, I'll try it on the octave so you can hear the pitch, but hopefully you can't tell. Oops, that was clunky. I should have warmed up for this, you guys, on the spot. He'd say, I saw that. But the idea is that going between the fourth finger or any finger, but between one string to the other is seamless. You can't actually tell that it's happening. And I found while, um, cause he'd always have me show him that exercise at the next lesson. Thinking about it is that while you're traveling up the fingers, you can always be on, where's my bridge? <laughs> when you're, well, obviously when you're on the D string, you can either be on the A string side of the D or you could be on the G string side of the D. So while you're playing the notes on the D string, you're just ever so gradually transferring the weight over towards the other string. And you can think of it like a double stop, you know, and then gradually just be on the other string. Does that answer? I mean, I personally, before I ever met him, I like to do um, that idea of the uh, suspension bridge and just literally like in a staccato, Take a staccato, teeny little staccato, and then see where that balance feels. And then move in another. And then, uh, you know, gradually, I had to do this in, a, in Indiana University where there was a 10 o'clock sound curfew. And I thought, well, I could still practice, or you could even actually do it right above the string if you want it to be more tricky. I mean, doing, and also doing a bow that lasts for 60 seconds in each direction is incredible. I don't know, raise your hands if you do that. Jill does, no? So, I mean, we 30, could- 32 like, seconds. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I challenge my students and they'll go up to 90 or, uh, you know, like if, if you really like, either in a staccato or just such a slow motion, you mean, you gotta have good rosining going on, but so you can just barely hear that it's moving. It might be a bunch of da 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 you know, but that's okay. And I found for me doing that both directions each way as a routine, it got me over a shake bow, you know. You can still be nervous, but your arm just automatically remembers and understands how to be relaxed in all of those connective tissue places or something, you know. That's what I think anyway. So, um, so I got one more thing and it's part of the book after he showed me the push pull and the down bow and up bow and the adding the fingers, which is amazing. Um, I'll read uh, right next. Apropos to my marveling at his left hand dexterity, Mr. Primrose then assigned me the following number, study number one from book one, uh, Shradiak. I don't know how you spell that. Exercises for promoting dexterity in various positions. I don't know if it sounds familiar, but it would be. It goes on and on like that. So his instructions were play the entire study at a quarter note equals 40 to 50. 
And this can apply to any left-hand dexterity set study or piece that you're playing at all, I found, you know. Um, but Shadiak uh, at number one is good because it's really good for just pure left-hand dexterity. So for quarter note equals 40 to 50. And first you play it in quarter notes right along with metronome. Da, da, da. And of course I'm singing faster than 40. Um, and then in eighth notes, with the same metronome going, so it's double, right? And then in 16th notes, and you take all of the repeats, and there were lots of repeats. So, you know, you, you just really, the first time feels incredibly slow, right? But it's finding that pitch, right? And then you would double it. I'm going fast, I know, right? All the way through. And then tell you with each measure, whatever the measures are, going all the way through. Um, and what he would have me do is uh, not maybe not that one in particular, but he would have me play it all the way through in the first position and then do it again in the second position or something. So that, you know. <laughs> you're getting the dexterity, but you're getting it in different, um, what do you call it, patterns of your left hand. Play with a full sound on this, employing push, pull, I'm gonna call it push, pull now because we talked about that throughout. Playing all the way from the frog to the tip, making sure that you use the entire bow. And the bow changes should be smooth and undetectable so that, that it's all just like the same speed of a needle going in a record player or something. The left hand should be articulate with and with it, even vibrato on each note when it's the whole notes, but when you start getting within 40 past the eighth notes, I'd say don't vibrate, that's what I recall. Um, and then on the uh, Shradiac, just to finish that, those are um, really great for the left hand, but they're only on one string each. So what you would do is play, let's say on Monday, you do this entire thing on the D string and on Tuesday the G string and Wednesday the C string and Thursday the, the you know A and then just rotate it uh, continually and I wrote a note here this this is also good on applied to Kreutzer number two three and five I saw Tom just nodding nodding off or nodding <laughs> So um, that's really, unless you want me to just keep on going, I'd, I'd love to just um, take any questions you guys are curious about or comments about any of the different few topics we covered. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, did he ever talk much about his years playing the violin? Oh, who is this? This is Harry. Harry. Oh, Harry, I can't see you. You know, with me, he didn't speak about playing the violin, but I do recall uh, recently my brother, who had come to visit, tape recorded a whole lesson. And um, the, the, the subject of it came up, and he was saying my, my number one advice for somebody who's switching to the viola from the violin is to slow down the bow. Um, and then we were in the Hindemith Concerto, we were doing the chords and he was talking more and more, getting on me about using the weight of your arm. And then, you know, I think that in violin, you can use a lighter weight of your arm and a faster speed a lot of the time. So it was talking about that weight. And I said, well, I've been practicing. I see what you mean. I've been practicing violin because I was teaching Suzuki and going through that repertoire. And he said, oh, I don't believe in playing both at the same time. So that's all I really can tell you. I love his violin playing, though, Harry. <laughs> it's incredible. But he fell in love with the viola. That's what happened. <laughs> well, who wouldn't, right? Well, that's what happened to me. I was just going to say that I totally agree with that. And there's yeah. a YouTube's available of Hindemith playing Hindemith. Yes. And yeah. it's, it's very amazing because he goes so quickly. He just is right. very fleet. Mm-hmm. And um, also Jody Levis has posted a Counter Music 5 that she did maybe 10 years ago. So oh, nice. things that are worth listening to that are mm -hmm. very interesting. But Hindemith playing Hindemith. Oh, I know. He does. Oh one thing I, 
<laughs> I did study the Hinemeth with Primrose, and I'm, I'm writing about that extensively, just the details of everything. But um, the key in my mind is that he said it's absolutely essential to play it at the correct metronome markings. And I, I did check Hindemith. He is doing 60 at the beginning. It seems fast, but mm -hmm. and 100 at the 100 of the Allegro. <laughs> Hindemith playing Mozart sounds like Hindemith too. True, and also I do think that once we hear old recordings, there's a, a bit of a speed up that happens with what used to be a record. I'm not sure, but anyway. Well, it's interesting since we're talking about weight, you know, who, whomever plays the Hindemith Concerto, just an added light is when you get to this double stop section, you know, with the three notes. So if we're trying to play all three, at that point, Primo said, you want to think about your hand as more the, the way a cellist would play. And you drop the weight of your pinky. So that brings down the weight down into the middle of your palm. And he says, it's easy, just don't press, don't think so hard, it's easy, <laughs> he kept telling me. And you go for the middle string, and you get all three, you know? And you just, so I, I, even though my pinky was up, I'm still feeling as if I've dropped the weight of it. You know, you've seen cellists, how they have that down here. So it's that feeling. And go ahead and scrub. <laughs> <clears throat> did anybody, I would selfishly like to ask the parts that I read from the book, did they seem clear and interesting to you? Anything you didn't get or would like to get more? Ted's nodding. When's, when will it be published? <laughs> as soon as I get, now that COVID's making me stay home and doing this is really helpful. Um, and I would like to say, I know this is so graciously um, hosted by Katie and Daria, especially. But um, anyone who's interested in being a viola nerd with me, I'm happy to Zoom. I have a Zoom account. If we wanted, I don't know, even Sundays, I could continue the lessons I haven't gone over yet um, and share them with you. And it helps to get your feedback as well. So think about it. I think everybody uh, universally would like to get the hieroglyphics for the. Okay. Uh, seems. The hieroglyph. I'm calling it that because. So okay. You can uh, you can send me a, you can either scan it or send me a, photo or, whatever, whatever works. We'll try. Okay, I like. Oh, that's true. Someone said. Oh, Carol said. Actually, these are Boeing variations, not rhythmic, but we did do rhythms at the end. Uh, sustained bow. Oh, see, I'm seeing your pection. Can you send these patterns? Yes, indeed, I will. Um, yeah. And uh, we could continue with that Kreutzer 13 or the more Kreutzers. And I feel what I was starting to say at the beginning is I do feel that um, he wrapped up kind of like a whole, the essence of, you know, physically being natural, which left hand etudes, which right hand ones and which repertoire, like, you know, um, after the etudes we were on, going on Martelet, so then he gave me the opening to the box suite to learn that prelude and do with that Martelet on each stroke. So which pieces are good for what? And we went over the box suite and the Hindemith. Um, but I feel really it was the essence of being around somebody who's a genius, just truly daily dedication to his practice and to teaching and he loved teaching you know and to playing and he devoted himself to the viola in the way that he also did to his fascinations i mean he was he could fly an airplane he was master at chess uh, he was interested in sumo wrestlers from japan and scottish terriers and you know so whatever it was that he was doing he did with fascination and love and he, you know, it sounds corny, but he, he said you should play every single day as if it was your last one. And I think he exemplified that with the preparation of being, you know, down to 100%. You get it 150, so you're ready. And, you know, these days I feel we don't have the pressure of having to make it be perfect, except maybe in an audition. But, you know, he was forging the field of solo viola and getting, you know, concertizing everywhere and getting reviews and bringing this great instrument to light. So he made sure it was impeccable. <laughs> anyway. 
Anything else you guys want to say or? Yeah, I have another question. Mm -hmm. was, right. uh, was finger flexibility a problem or an issue for you before you began to work with him? Oh, that's a good question. Did you demonstrate that very well, by doing that? Oh, thank you. I, you know, I realized I was kind of lifting off a little bit just so I could be showing you which finger I'm, you know what I mean, instead of keeping it round. Um, I don't think flexibility so much by itself as much as the awareness that my left and right hand were separate entities, you know? So that when I was feeling the weight of the bow, let's say playing a really full sound, then I would tend myself to squeeze too hard, you know? Um, and along, Harry, along those lines, I mean, he gave me, I don't know where it came from, but it was a violin piece by Shraddick a double stop etude that was three pages long with repeats he made me do the whole darn thing but each one was a different combination of two fingers starting like i'll just do one let's see i'll do a harder one would be maybe three and a two with lifting a one, four, one. And the double it. So it was a, a shradiac with each combination of a double stop. And he made me do that whole darn thing all the way through, including at the lesson before he told me that the main point of it is that your thumb is in a different, see if I can show this, it should be in a different position depending on your double stop. So your your left hand is much more important than your thumb. We tend to, you know, see squeezing a lot. But there's a certain circumstance, let's say I'm playing a three and a four, where I might actually need to have my thumb up high, you know? But the, you wanna find the place where, you're, where your two fingers are comfortable and then the thumb will be accommodating. It could be up uh, under the neck or around. So, um, that was a key thing he told me at the end after I played it for him. And luckily, I, by the time you end up playing that, you kind of do figure that out because otherwise you just start dying of straining them. So I think it was a combination of the two things of thinking of the lifting rather than pressing and then having the thumb be accommodating whatever the pattern, you know, the hand is shaped in so that your fingers are flexible and square. I mean, square top, you know, so that they're relatively in the same position, depending on whatever position you're in or string, right? This is just moving around and the thumb accommodates. And the other thing is just getting the weight of the arm to be separate issue and not squeezing with the left hand. And the third thing, again, is going back to that old shoulder rest thing, because if you're pressing, I, you know, tend to, at the time, I think I pressed down a lot more. And, and depended on this kind of support of a shoulder rest rather than to think light and airy, you know, fluffy, which is a little easier if you ever go try a violin. It just feels like a toy. I mean, feel more like as if you're playing a violin on your left hand, you know, and then let the bow slow down, be in the string. Was that too long an answer? <laughs> uh -uh. Okay. Thank you, Eleanor. Unless there are other questions, I think we should. <laughs> Katie. We Thank should you. Clap. And Thank you guys for joining my viola nerd party. I love being a viola nerd. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. so Thank you, fun. Eleanor. Sure. Thank you. Oh, Joe Floyd is there. Look at that. I can see people's names. Thank you. Um, yeah, and um, maybe I will send, uh, for sure I'll send out the hieroglyphics, but um, Perhaps when Katie, uh, Daria, if you send it to people, anyone who wants to send me an email after that to let me know if you're interested in continuing this on my Zoom, uh, that would be a great time to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just to clarify, Eleanor's thinking of doing a series of uh, viola sessions on, on Zoom herself that uh, would focus uh -huh. more on the uh, on more of this um, Primrose's wisdom. So um, we will post a recording of this on uh, the Northern California Viola Society website. You can revisit 
in case you're wondering what the hieroglyphics mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. When you get them. Yeah. And, uh, Yes, again, th thank you so, so I sure much. wish we could all be playing together. And I don't know, I was thinking about the um, time I was in Germany studying with Ursch Koch, and I was with all these Germans, and we went out in Siena, in Tuscany, and we just took our violas out on this hill and played Brandenburg Six together. Just, we should do a COVID viola nerd somewhere outside. <laughs> thank you. Oh, also, Jill's house, Mitchell Park. Yeah, why not? Jill's putting that together, so pay, um, watch for details. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Don't dare me to do that, I will. Okay, I'll come. Okay. You're, you're the central location. Yes, I know, I'm getting tired of doing it by myself. I'm recording myself playing all these parts to different things. I've got like 20 of them now. I don't have anything to do with them. Do you, you, know, um, do you still, is there still that amphitheater at Mitchell Park? Because we could yeah. be putting our masks on and just stand out there if it's not raining or too cold yet. Hey. Absolutely. I'll meet you there on uh, there. Wednesday morning. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> well, some of you guys have to drive farther. Anyway, mm -hmm. I'm so, so appreciative. Thank you guys so much for... Thank you, Eleanor. Okay. Thank you.